Hello, hello, and welcome back to Glycanhub, the podcast in which we explore health, disease, and longevity through the lens of glycobiology. My name is Rina, and I am your host. We are living longer than ever before, but unfortunately, our health span or how long we live in good health doesn't tend to align with our lifespan. That is the length of life overall. And as our average lifespan increases, thanks to advancements in medicine and healthcare, we are seeing a rise in age-related diseases, leading to a decline in quality of life during our later years. Unfortunately, a common cause of cognitive decline among the older individuals is neurodegenerative diseases, of which Alzheimer's is the most common. Today's episode is an expedition into the fascinating and somewhat mysterious landscape of our brain. More specifically, the role glycans play in its structure and function. My guest today will introduce us to the way glycan research reframed our understanding of the cause of Alzheimer's disease. We will discuss the difficulty of identifying early biomarkers of Alzheimer's, the challenges of drug delivery to the brain, as well as how our understanding of the structural role of glycans in the nervous system could aid in mending spinal cord injuries in the future. We'll also touch upon how to discern the reliability of science reporting in the media, particularly concerning Alzheimer's prevention. My guest today is a seasoned expert in the field, having devoted over four decades to the study of glycobiology. He is a professor and interim director of the Department of Pharmacology and Molecular Sciences and a professor of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His research focuses on cyanoglycans in the control of nervous system proteinopathies, as well as cell-to-cell interaction in inflammation as it pertains to respiratory health, and asthma in particular. A warm welcome to Ronald Schnarr. Hello and welcome to our podcast. Thank you. Delighted to be here, Rena. So before we start talking about your research, I want to learn more about what was it that initially drew you to glycobiology. It is a field that is often overlooked and neglected. Um, and so I'm just curious, what was it that initially attracted you to it? And what is it that still keeps you interested today? Interestingly, uh, what, I, what got me into this field is still what I do today. And this was many years ago when I was a young graduate student and hadn't decided what I wanted to research yet. And I saw a talk by another graduate student. And what he showed is that some artificial beads he made that had sugars attached to their surface interacted with human cells. And if you put one sugar on, the cells would ignore it. If you put another sugar on, the cells would crowd around. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, they're communicating with cells. They're, they're speaking a cell language. And I want to do that. And so I actually began working in glycobiology then. One of the leaders in the field, uh, Saul Roseman, uh, was at the institution, Johns Hopkins, where I was doing my graduate work. And I requested that he allow me to join his team. And we worked on glycans and cell recognition, which, as you know, is still what I'm doing today. We have advanced over those years, but a lot, but it's the same field. So I'm curious, how, how many years has it been that you've uh, been researching in this field? Over four decades. Um, so uh, I've watched the field grow around me. I've watched the tools become available, and I've watched the knowledge expand remarkably. In the days when I started, we knew that sugars could be recognized in nature because some pathogens like influenza virus bind to sugars. But we didn't know that 
we kind of intuited, but we didn't know that our own cells could recognize sugars or what that was about. And since then, that field has exploded, and we know a whole lot about it now. It's very interesting. Could you tell me a bit more about what is meant by cell-to-cell interaction, and um, what have you learned that how what have you learned that is the role of glycans um, in that interaction? We're social animals, inside and out. Uh, and inside, we have trillions of cells, different kinds of cells. And as part of a efficient functioning organism, those cells have to recognize each other and respond appropriately. We don't respond the same when we run into our grocer as we do when we run into our grandmother. And that's because we recognize them as being different. The surfaces of cells are covered with glycans. It's the face of the cell. So it's sensible that cell recognition, that is the ability of cells to recognize and respond appropriately to each other, has to do, at least in part, with what glycans are there. And cells can molecularly take a snapshot of that and respond accordingly. Just to make it clear, this cellular interaction is present in every, essentially every organ, every part of our body. Um, but you have primarily focused, if I'm not mistaken, in, to inflama- on inflammation and um, neuro- neurobiology. Um, and one of your, to me, very interesting areas of research was on gangliosides. Could you explain what they are and what their role um, is in the brain? Sugars are attached to the surface of your cells. They, don't, they, they would float off if they weren't attached. And they can be attached to lipids, which are embedded in the surface of your cells, and then the sugar sticks out, or to proteins. Um, and when they're uh, bound to lipids, they're called glycolipids or glycosphingolipids. And some of those that have our for humans and other mammals, our favorite uh, sugar at the outermost uh, terminus, outermost point of the glycan, it's called sialic acid, especially well suited molecularly for recognition. If it has a sialic acid, those glycolipids are called gangliosides. Now, they're everywhere. They're in every cell in your body. But in the brain, they dominate. In your liver, most of your glycans are on glycoproteins. In your brain, most of them are on glycolipids. We really don't know why that is. But when I started uh, investigating recognition function of molecules, there were two great reasons why I focused on gangliosides. One is that unlike glycoproteins, which can be very large and have a whole bunch of different sugars attached to them, and the sugars can be different along the chain. It makes it kind of, you know, you purify it and you see what it does functionally to cells. It makes it kind of difficult to interpret. Gangliosides are individual single, single chain of sugars on a single lipid. And you can separate them that way. And then you can test them for what they're doing. So brain, and I can get them easily to test. And our team did that. And we began looking for recognition. Now, how do we do that? We assumed, because there was no evidence, that in order for a sugar to be able to generate a response, it had to be recognized. So if this is your sugar, there had to be something out there that recognized it that would result in some kind of response. So we took that, we purified those individual gangliosides from the brain, and we tagged them so that we could follow them experimentally. And we asked, is there anything in the brain that binds these? And in fact, we found things. And the one that we focused on was a protein uh, that specifically binds to just two of the major brain gangliosides based on their structure. And we found out what it did. And um, let me back up. 
So in your brain, all of the nerve cells communicate with each other by sending out long threads called axons that carry electrical signals that then can communicate with other cells. And like wires, they aren't wires, but like wires, they have to be insulated to work properly. And that insulation that wraps the axons is called myelin. And what we found, it was a surprise to us, but this is the way it works, is that the protein, it's called myelin-associated glycoprotein, or MAG, that recognizes ganglioside, it, it is on the myelin and the ganglioside on the axon. And that's one of the ways that this wrapping, this insulation, stays on the axon. And we were able then to identify the structures involved. And then in mice, where we can manipulate the genes, we changed genes in the mice so that they couldn't produce the ganglicides recognized. And what do you know? Those mice had problems maintaining their myelin. They became uh, uh, crippled. As they aged, their myelin fell off. Their axons degraded. That's what's hap what happened. And they were dragging their hindquarters around. So we discovered that gangliosides are recognized by a protein called MAG, and that this interaction is responsible for stabilizing the insulation wrapping around axons. And if you're missing it, you got problems in especially your long axons, like the ones from your spine to your toe. So um, your mobility fails, but others as well. Now, you said you engineered um, these um, defects in mice, but do such diseases exist in humans as well? They do. After we made these discoveries, it was timely because uh, the genetic revolution was providing the tools to sequence genes and find out which genes had problems in genetic diseases. And sure enough, the very gene that we knocked out in mice that resulted in their lack of ability to move their hindquarters turned out in a human, rare human disease called human spastic paraplegia which has the same outcome. People who are missing this gene have problems with their mobility, and most of them end up in wheelchairs. So it, we were able to, to know why now these people had that. Interestingly, we had some hints in the mice that they had deficits in their intellectual abilities, not as easy to measure in mice. But the people who have this gene missing, the humans that have this gene missing, are intellectually impaired. They, they have low IQs across the board. So the ganglioides, which we know are very prominent in the brain, these structures are involved in both uh, motor and behavioral uh, maintenance, uh, development and maintenance in humans. Just in general, when it comes to congenital disorders of ganglioside biosynthesis, how, how, frequent, how frequently do these appear in the population? They're rare. They're inbred uh, uh, errors. In certain populations, they pop out. And in particular, there's, so, so we knocked out some of the very terminal sugars on gangliosides, and that's what causes paraplegia and mild intellectual disability. But there's a, a, a knockout or a mutation that occurs in humans even further earlier that knocks out essentially all of the major gangliosides. Those kids are in bad shape. I've, I've visited with them. Um, this is a disease that comes on very early, uh, severe intellectual disability. Uh, none of them are uh, conversant. 
uh, and they have very limited communications. Uh, it's a terrible disease, and they are unable to to walk. They have motor disabilities as well. Um, so uh, the question was, how many people have this? Well, in this community uh, called, called Old Order Amish, which is a small community in the middle of the state of Ohio in the United States, there are probably a hundred of these uh, patients. So in that community, it's a very major problem. In this tiny community, they have a hundred children. They live to be maybe into their mid to late teens that have this disease. But in general, we're talking about worldwide, probably only hundreds of cases, maybe thousands of cases. And so I imagine the treatment options are not very vast. Zero, essentially. Um, we've discussed that. We've discussed that as teams of physicians caring for these patients and those of us that have knowledge in the area. And... Um, the attempts uh, at one level, the easiest attempt is to try to feed back the missing ganglioside. That's tough because it's hard to get things that you eat into your brain. Um, the, the other option here is genetic engineering. And I, I think that may, may uh, have some promise. Interestingly, and, and, and maybe uh, people listening to this would, would, would like to know about this, that there have been diseases of gangliosides, especially the breakdown of gangliosides, uh, where uh, the, the enzyme missing to break them down, uh, sorry, the enzyme is missing to break them down. They build up in your brain and you die at a very young age. This has essentially disappeared by genetic counseling. We know the gene. We can identify if you have it or not. It's recessive, which means both your mom and dad have to have it. So those of us in communities like Ashkenazi Jewish community that had a lot of this disease called Tay-Sachs disease, well, we, we all get tested. And then we know, and we know to, to look, you know, I, I know I don't have the gene at all, so my children can't have it. But if my wife had it, then our children could be uh, our, our sorry, our we could have, um, uh, we could have uh, testing, uh, uh, amniotic testing, and know whether our kids uh, have this devastating, horrid disease. So communities that are willing to do that, you can wipe out these diseases by genetic counseling. When it comes to your research in gangliosides. Um what has been the focus other than looking at um, these congenital disorders? We're very interested in uh, the broader functions. Uh, again, we're talking about molecular recognition. In this case, in the one case, we were able to, to find out that myelin wrapped axons. Now, it's interesting. You may know, and, and your viewers may know, or your listeners may know that, um, when you have injuries to the nervous system, they tend not to heal. The nerves don't grow back. One of the reasons is that molecules in the myelin that used to insulate those axons actually are telling the axons to be stable and not regrow. So, for example, we know that myelin-associated glycoprotein sends that signal through gangliosides. And so we were able then to devise an approach of administering to, in this case, rats that we had uh, caused a spinal cord injury, an enzyme that would change their gangliosides, and in that case, release the inhibition and let the axons grow back better. So this is the kind of approach we're taking, discovering the interactions, and then every time we discover an interaction, the question is, well, what can we do with that that can alleviate 
uh, disease. And just to put it in perspective for our listeners, how long does it usually take from doing these types of experiments, experiments with mice in the lab to potentially applying um, this for people with spinal cord injuries in real life? Uh, there's a lot of levels of, of complexity, but uh, decades Decades is a, is a good rule from from discovery of a target to uh, delivery, uh, therapeutic delivery to humans. And for better or for worse, the, the, the economics have to be there. It, you know, it takes a billion dollars to develop a drug. So you have to also have a... Uh, the, the economics to support that effort. Absolutely. Now, another concern that's ri rising is related to the fact that we are an aging population is an increase in neurodegenerative diseases and dementia. Now, a lot of your research has also focused on Alzheimer's disease. And so I'm curious, how would you say our understanding of Alzheimer's has changed or developed in the recent years? It's a great question. And it has developed. So what did we learn earlier? We learned that Alzheimer's is a disease of accumulation of trash in the brain. This trash is misfolded proteins, proteins that should have a function, but instead get crumpled and build up. And uh, there's two classes of those called uh, plaques and tangles of different proteins that build up in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. And it still is a strong hypothesis that these plaques and tangles result in the uh, death of, of nerve cells. So pharmaceutical companies focused on stopping the plaques from forming. That's the first thing that happens. And they got some drugs that would stop or diminish plaque formation. And they tested them in patients that had Alzheimer's symptoms, and they failed to help, which was a big disappointment. And so what did we learn from that? Well, so as you may know, Alzheimer's builds up for many, many years, decades. Things build up in your brain well before you have symptoms. And the concept now is by the time you're having symptoms, it's probably too late. And we really, or it's too late to go in and block plaque formation. It may not be too late to, to clear out other trash in the brain actively, but we can't just, when we have a patient come in with Alzheimer's symptoms, stop new plaques from forming and treat them. So that's one thing we learned. The other thing that, that has driven some of our research is that with the power of genetics, which I mentioned earlier, we've now gone, as a field, we've gone into uh, large populations and uh, explored their entire genetic code and then asked which of these people are susceptible to Alzheimer's and which of these people get old but never get Alzheimer's and compared their genetic makeup. And what, what was found, surprisingly again, not in retrospect, is that a lot of these genes showed up in cells called microglia, these microglia are kind of the immune system of the brain. They're specialized cells only in the brain. And what's their job? Clean up trash. So it was like, oh, there's, there's a problem with trash cleanup. And so one of the driving forces of our recent work is that a gene called CD33 was found to be associated with people that are more susceptible or families more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that CD33 puts the brakes on microglia. 
and stops the trash truck. And if you have a genetic makeup, so you make lots of this break, CD33, you're more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease. Rarely, some people have a gene that the truck doesn't have any breaks, and they're less susceptible to Alzheimer's disease. So this is one pathway we're interested in why. It turns out CD33 is a glycan binding protein. That's what led us into this field. Have you um, also been able to explain why is it that, if this is a genetic um, issue when it comes to microglia, um, why is it that it occurs progressively as we age? As you could imagine, the day the trash strike starts in New York, things are okay. A week later, things are still kind of okay. A month later, you can't get around anymore. So this is a, this is a, a long-term progressive buildup in the brain. And, and this is, by the way, this is another opportunity for therapeutic approaches to Alzheimer's disease. Since the failure of the plaque-stopping drugs, one thing that scientists have been trying to do is discover markers, that is, molecules that we can measure in our blood, for example, that tell us if you are in the very early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Now, essentially the only way to, unfortunately, the only way to prove somebody has Alzheimer's disease is after they die and you look at their histology of their brain. We can guess they have early Alzheimer's because of cognitive symptoms, but wouldn't it be great if we knew that this process, that the, that the, the trash collectors were on strike even before the trash started to build up? Then maybe we could go in and do something. And that's the hope. That's the therapeutic hope. Could you also explain what is... Um... When it comes to conducting these studies, I guess when it comes to human tissue, it's usually post-mortem um, that you acquire it. Um, so how, what are some of the challenges when it comes to studying Alzheimer's um, and acquiring human tissue to use? That's a barrier. And when I began in this work, uh, there are a few brain banks around the world that can provide donated tissues. And this depends on families who care about furthering the science over the very long term. We talked about decades. This isn't going to help the next person in line, but it might help down the road. Uh, their willingness to approve tissue donations. Now, recently, I was fortunate to uh, uh, have a collaboration with a group right here at Johns Hopkins called the Lieber Institute that has perhaps the world's largest bank of human brain tissue for various uh, neurological diseases. And so now uh, we have a, a plan to select, um, and what, what happens, and, and you know, this tough to think about, but what happens is when somebody dies and their brain is donated, they have a, a quick system where they can study the histology of the brain, get information about the diseases, if any, that the patient had, and categorize these. And as I mentioned, Alzheimer's can be uh, diagnosed post-mortem. So they have non-Alzheimer's brains and Alzheimer's brains at different stages. And now we can begin to probe what's different and know what's different. And associated with that, we're doing studies with microglia. And now we can actually make human microglia from stem cells in the laboratory. And we're finding out how we can rev up their trash collection or reverse the inhibition that they get from CD33. So together, 
by understanding the molecules in Alzheimer's that are involved and how we can alter or rev up microglia, we might get a what we call a lead molecule, a, a molecule that we can define that we think can resolve some aspects of Alzheimer's, then it's a long road to animal testing and then a long road to safety and a long road to human trials. And there's pitfalls at every step. So let me say this. The probability that we're going to learn something new that's useful is very high. The probability that we, I, small laboratories, going to come up with a cure for Alzheimer's is very low. But as a team, the thousands of us around the world that are working on these problems are going to come up with the information that's going to allow us to move forward and make this something uh, uh, historical, uh, if not for our children, for our grandchildren. Do such initiatives exist already when it comes to collaboration around the world for Alzheimer's? Collaboration in biomedical sciences is international. Um, always has been. I was just, if I may, an aside, I was just reading about uh, some important studies on glycans uh, that led to breakthroughs in recognition uh, that were going on in the 1940s. And a key connection was made between an investigator in Sweden and an investigator in Australia when they, met, when they met in a conference in Cambridge in 1949. This is how science works. So the important aspect to accelerating discovery is bringing more people in to do it and providing the resources they need to do it. And for that, there are national efforts through funding agencies in each country. And there are private agencies like the Alzheimer's Foundation, Cure for Alzheimer's, and I'm sure they are around the world, that raise funds to inject into the field to further key discoveries. Now, just going a little bit backwards, um, we mentioned um, accumulation of misfolded proteins, we mentioned waste um, clearance. Now, I think more kind of traditionally, at least the way I was taught, was mainly to blame um, the <clears throat> accumulation of misfolded proteins. Um, but now, would you say that the cause of Alzheimer's is dual in that it is for people who are more predisposed predisposed to the disease, they prob likely have an issue with a higher accumulation of waste proteins and then a lower um, waste clearance. I would say that's, that's the case. And, and, and the genetics on that is pretty strong. Um, it may, you know, Alzheimer's may not have one genetic, it certainly doesn't have one gene that causes it. We'd already know that. But it, it may have more than one genetic association or pathway that leads to this. In every case, Alzheimer's in particular has this buildup of plaques and tangles in the brain that we can see by histology and quantify so we know what stage of Alzheimer's there is in the, but it's only postmortem. So we're, we're convinced you know, there's a lot of debate since the since the inhibitors of, of plaque formation fail. There's been a lot of debate. Did we get this all wrong? Is this a what we call an epiphenomenon, uh, coincidental? I'd say the field right now still has some in it that says, yeah, let's forget about plaques and tangles. But almost everybody that I know that's studying this area feels that plaques and tangles are the end product that result in nerve death. Now, much of your research um, uses mice as models of disease, um, and they are most frequently used animal. How accurately would you say that the mouse brain can replicate human disease? The answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. And it, in the brain, it turns out the brain is a pretty, priv what we call a privileged site. 
we have lots of protection around it, of our skull, of course, but even inside we have membranes and blood brain barrier. And, and we really don't let pathogens get into our brains. So things have stayed pretty much the same there over the course of evolution. So that, for instance, myelin associated glycoprotein, MAG, as I mentioned earlier, and its binding gangliosides, we were able to show that mice and humans have the same disorder if the key molecules in that connection are missing. And it is the same. It's different in the immune system. It's different outside the brain. <laughs> Microglia are part of the immune system, but even those, it's different in the immune system between mice and men. Why is that? Well, it turns out that over evolution, one of the biggest challenges to us surviving has been our ability to fight pathogens. Pathogens and we are having a war. And so we have immune systems that use glycans to drive immune responses, eventually pathogens learn that. They mimic our part of the immune glycan repertoire to change our response so they can get away with proliferating inside our bodies. So then we evolutionarily change over time. Those of us that don't have the same sugars are less susceptible to those diseases and survive to have families. And so since between rodents and humans, there's been a lot of changes in glycans and there's been changes in glycan binding proteins. We kind of have the same systems in place, but the details are different. Let me give you an example. Um, we have a molecule on uh, some of our immune cells called SIGLEC8. It controls our allergic responses and is involved in things like asthma. We discovered the sugar it binds to in the human airways. And mice don't have sig like hate. They have, I mean, we don't, need, we don't use numbers for most of the mice molecules like that. We call it sig like F. And when we look for molecules that bind SIGLIC8 in my, mouse airways, they don't exist. So between mice and humans, we've changed a lot in the immune system. So I gave a lecture once uh, entitled, Mice Aren't Always Men. So here's the story. For m the most basic biological processes, like genes, like making proteins. We are like bacteria. So bacteria are a good model. We're like yeast. We're like mice. So across species, we can do these studies. For other areas that have evolved more rapidly, like glycans, there are areas that are very different. And so you, just like I said, Glycans and recognition in the brain, same in mouse and man. Glycans and recognition in allergic inflammation, different mice and men. Has to be tested in every case. Now you said you were working with stem cells um, and growing microglia in the lab. I'm curious when it comes to therapeutic potentials, how can our knowledge of currently what you've discovered about inhibitory signaling in microglia and Alzheimer's disease, how could this be used for therapeutic purposes? This is the dream. It's it's not a fantasy. <laughs> there are there are actually companies thinking about this now. It's just beginning. But here's the way it works in microglia. The microglia have the sugar binding protein on their surface. It's not doing anything. And the microglia are going around collecting trash. They come into contact with a particular sugar that we identified in the human brain. And now it says, stop, put the brakes on. So what can we do about that? Well, if we knew this exact shape and how it fit, we could maybe make something small enough to deliver to your brain that instead of this going in, this small thing sticks in it, it doesn't signal, 
It just blocks it. And now it's like there was, this wasn't even there. And your microglia say, okay, there's nothing stopping us. We're going to go pick up the trash. That's, that's the fantasy of this. Um, there are many steps yet to prove it uh, at the cell level. Can we actually manipulate the ability of, of microglia to phagocytosis stuff? That's eat the trash. And we do this by having microglia in, in a, a, a Petri dish, and we give them tiny fluorescent particles or even fluorescent plaque. And we uh, looked at them under the microscope over time, and we watched them gobbling it up. Now, you've mentioned the levels of protection of the brain. So could you maybe explain a bit further for our listeners, um, what are the main challenges when it comes to drug delivery to the brain? Actually, there's two ways that we can deliver drugs to the brain. The reasonable way and the very difficult way. The reasonable way is you eat something, it goes into your bloodstream, or you inject it into your vein, and it goes into your bloodstream, and then it spontaneously moves across the membranes called the blood-brain barrier. And this happens. Some molecules have the properties appropriate to make it to the brain, and others don't. Uh, so part of pharmacology, part of drug development is working on shapes and additions to molecules to get them to be just the right flavor to move into the brain. The other way we can deliver things to the brain is to implant a pump and pump it right into your uh, spinal cerebral spinal fluid. That's highly unusual, and that kind of approach for example, might be used in acute spinal cord injury to, to, to deliver drugs to the site of injury inside the blood-brain barrier, where you're going to just treat for you know a month or three months and then withdraw the treatment. Now, when it comes to the work that's been done on biomarkers, um, as of biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, um, what role do glycans play there? Is there much work when it comes to glycan research in that area? It's just at the very beginning. Um, the, the, there's a lot of work going on in glycan biomarkers, you may know. That's been in cancer. And that's because cancer cells early on were realized to have different glycans on their surface. So there's been a lot of investment worldwide on research of blood glycans and how they relate to cancer development. So the technology is there to do that. There's even in the United States a group called uh, the Alliance of Glycobiologists, funded by the National Institutes of Health, to do just that in cancer. So now that people are looking for markers in Alzheimer's disease, that same approach that's been developed over the years can be applied. Early days. No, it, especially, especially as you've mentioned, Alzheimer's develops over decades. So it would be yes, right. ideal scenario you can detect it 20, 30 years before you develop symptoms. Yeah, would that be great? I think that the likelihood... So the other aspect of this is that like I mentioned, changes in the CD33 gene are associated with, with an enhanced likelihood of, of Alzheimer's. Uh, it isn't an on-off switch. It, it, it makes you more susceptible. But And now, each and every one of us can get our whole genome uh, sequenced. And many of those genes, hundreds of them, of them are involved in making glycans or in proteins that recognize glycans. So that's another way we can begin to look at this, is how about those glycan genes? Are those different? And if they're different in disease, what does that imply? What are the structures that are made by those, out the, the proteins made by those genes? And is there something we can test and then do, 
do something. I'm very optimistic, but it's it's saddening to hear that it's still very early days. Um, and it's going to take a long time. Yeah, I think that part of being a, a discovery biomedical researcher is a very high level optimism. Uh, we are going to solve these problems. They're not going to get solved by themselves. As an international team, biomedical discovery researchers are working to get knowledge that's going to lead to cures. We just have to have that faith. It's not a word to use for science, but it's faith, optimism, that we are going to be successful. And we have been. We have been for many diseases. We're doing much better now. Uh, my, my mother is having her 99th birthday party next month. <laughs> so when we look back, there's been a lot of advances. We just have to have faith that we're going in the right direction and we're going to keep doing what we're doing. If I'm not mistaken, it sounds like one of the best treatment options for Alzheimer's will be prevention in the long run. Um, what is What are the preventative measures that are currently available for Alzheimer's? Oh, none. Unfortunately, if we knew those, we'd all be doing it. And yeah, I know that that in my I get it in my news feed too, that that if you eat this or if you sleep on this side of the bed, you're you're less likely to get Alzheimer's. But frankly, there are no treatments that change the course of Alzheimer's uh, at this time. Uh, and uh, uh, There's lots of people interested in this terrible disease, as well as other neurodegenerative diseases. And and, uh, we have to take the longer view on that as scientists and say, we're going to dig, dig, dig. Thank you for opening the topic on um, regarding media and um, maybe even some bad signs being promoted or (laughs) fake news regarding Alzheimer's. So for our listeners who are maybe reading these types of... um, articles and are struggling to distinguish between what is real and what is um, just done for clickbait. Um, Could you maybe give some advice on that? Yeah, you have to go to a reliable source. And knowing what that is isn't always easy. But there are reliable sources. So at our level, um, quality science, uh, all science, quality or not, is judged by our peers, other scientists in the area, and then published in reputable journals. But how do you know what a reputable journal is? These are, these are collected by organizations that have the expertise on hand to know what's real and what's not. And in your area of the world, uh, there are Alzheimer's associations in the U.S. It's called the you know, the Alzheimer's Association, as well as national sources like the National Institutes of Health in the United States and uh, certain high level uh, media connected uh, research institutions uh, that uh, put out uh, newsletters. Um, And they have the expertise on hand, people with uh, high standards for evaluating science like you, Rena, that look at the science and bring forward things that are real and don't bring forward things that aren't. So if you read that rutabaga uh, would cure Alzheimer's and you go to the Alzheimer's information page at NIH and there's nothing about rutabagas there, uh, you, you know, it's not real. So um, over time, these things fall away and the real stuff ends up being at these sites that you can trust. And so find those sites if you're interested in uh, potential. You know, the unfortunate thing is that even in our field, glycobiology, uh, people will take advantage of those who are desperate people who have a loved one with cancer, people who have a loved one they are losing to Alzheimer's disease. And that desperation 
can lead to a mindset of, I'll try anything. And there are organizations out there that are happy to take your money and they'll sell you, they'll send you a package of anything. And it can give you some hope over the short term. But unless it's been tested, tried, and true, it's a waste of money. And I would I would uh, avoid those um, what appear like good opportunities but aren't. Frequently I see on social media um, articles about certain types of um, vegetables that help you prevent Alzheimer's. I think it's just very important for our listeners to understand that the studies that would need to be conducted for this to be scientifically proven would have to be longitudinal over decades um, and nothing so far, as far as I know has been done um, in that area. Yeah, and I think I, I think that that those that goes under the the category of it can't hurt. Yeah. So people say, should I eat more vegetables? Now you know, you know, um, uh, some of these things can hurt. Um, uh, the Dan Hurley wrote a book called Natural Causes, talking about uh, so-called uh, nutraceuticals, uh, some of which are actually can actually hurt you. So you really got to be careful. Easy, easy access. Sometimes you just got to pay a lot of money and, and they do, either do nothing and some can be harmful. So you have to be careful. I think we're nearing the end of our conversation. And so I want to focus now on um, asking you, what are your current goals in your, in your future research? What is, the, um, what is going to come out in the next, next few years from your lab? Yeah, so, so there's two, two interact one. Two interacting areas or two uh, areas that overlap that we're really interested in. Uh, one is going uh, deeper into the structures, the glycan structures that are driving these changes. And the two areas that we're thinking about are, as I mentioned earlier, uh, allergic inflammation and uh, microglia and Alzheimer's. Those are the two areas we're working on. And in both those areas, we have the the capabilities of uh, deconstructing the molecules we get from human airways or from human brain and breaking them down to their minimum active components and determining exactly what that structure is. And if we're going to be able to build deliverable molecules uh, for therapeutics, that's one thing we want to know. So when we get those in my laboratory, what do we do with them? As I mentioned, we put them on microglia. We, not, not, not in my laboratory because we don't have the capability, but we collaborate with a group in Chicago that isolates fresh immune, allergic immune cells from their patients in their clinical immunology uh, division. And we send them these molecules and they test them on those cells. So the, that's the combination. Find structures that we can identify and then put them on the cells that matter. And, and that's all preclinical work. Unfortunately, we really can't do that in rodents because they don't have the same glycans and glycan binding proteins as humans. We have to go after human tissues and human cells. So that's where we're aiming in the next that's our, our five-year plan. That's me knocking wood for good luck. <laughs> um, I, I'll certainly be very excited to see what, um, what your research you, you bring out. I'm curious, do you, do you consider any other animal models besides mice for the, the, this research? I don't personally. Certainly, um, there are um, primate models that can replicate the glyc better replicate, not perfectly replicate, the glycan uh, repertoire of humans. It turns out, even though between the great apes, our closest cousins, and, and evolutionarily and humans, there have been some major changes in, in glycobiology, uh, especially with the sialic acids that are involved in our recognition. There was a big change about half a million years ago uh, where we just went our own way. And so to conclude this conversation, 
Do you have a final message um, that you would like to say for our listeners? I think that, first of all, let me say that, that the world of glycans and their functions in human physiology and human disease is really advancing rapidly. I think there are going to be new discoveries and uh, action taken on old discoveries that are going to help out in dis- lots of diseases, immune diseases and cancer, maybe neurodegenerative diseases, but glycans are everywhere. And that uh, we are uh, working hard as an international community to discover those to the extent that we can build up that infrastructure to keep the um, discovery moving forward. We're enthusiastic about it. And we hope that the resources that come in to further this uh, enterprise are uh, maintained and, and we can continue and the next generation of scientists and the next can continue to make these discoveries that are going to be important to the health of you and your families, me and my family for that. For that matter. Thank you, Ron. It was really nice talking to you. Great talking with you too, Rena. Take care. I hope this conversation helped you better appreciate the sheer complexity of Alzheimer's disease. But I also hope that you are not leaving this episode disheartened, but rather encouraged by the collaborative effort of scientists and clinicians worldwide to develop better diagnostic methods, more effective treatment options, and potentially, one day, a cure. If you would like to access more information about this conversation and Ron's previous work, follow the link in the description to the show notes for this episode. Equally, if you want to find out more about Glycanage, head on to glycanage.com where you can access a whole list of our scientific publications, blog posts, testimonials, and of course, this is where you can order your Glycan Age test kit. Watch out for our next episode, where I will be joined by Gordon Lautz. I believe this is his third time on our podcast. Gordon is a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Zagreb. His research focuses on immunoglobulin G glycans, particularly in the context of chronic inflammation and biological age. We will discuss what glycan studies can tell us about COVID-19 symptoms and recovery. Please don't forget to leave ratings and reviews for this episode and engage with us on social media. Thank you for listening and have a great day. Oh,